Thank you. It, it's, a, it's a great honor for me to be here and addressing you. And Malcolm's left me a little nervous about proceeding. Uh, but let's get on with it. Um, so um, the principal question I'm interested in is, can we have evidence, good evidence, for causation in the single case? The answer I want to defend is yes. And then a second, do we need to establish a counterfactual to do so? No. Now, I realize that this is a rather ecumenical group, and it may be that um, I'm going to be uh, preaching to the converted, but I'm still going to proceed to uh, defend these two, um, two claims. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about, uh, I've constructed this um, chart of categories of evidence for the single case. I'm going to talk about it. Uh, we don't need to understand it yet, just that's what the focus is going to be. Um, the point about the categories, which are categories of evidence types for the single case, is that they're all things you would take for granted as good evidence for single case causality. Um, they're familiar, they're tried and true uh, methods of evidence in singular causation. We see them in legal proceedings all the time, um, which is the primary case where I think we see a lot of causal attribution uh, in a single case. Um, we make we use these in daily life all the time. When I try to figure out um, who left the dirty dishes in the sink, um, it's, I use these kind, this kind of evidence when I accuse my granddaughter, Lucy, of having done so. And uh, she says, why, may, why do you think that's right? Well, I have categories of evidence that I can produce. Um, we do this, and you do it, in case studies and causal uh, process tracing, and lots of, we, you know, lots of other places. Nevertheless, we are told that these categories, these con this kind of evidence, can't do the job. It can't warrant single case causality claims. Um, why? Well, skeptics, and especially the people I've been engaged with recently, uh, randomized control trial advocates, the skeptics say you must establish a counterfactual to establish a singular causal claim. So here's Ian Chalmers, one of the big gurus of evidence-based medicine. The need to compare like with like and fair tests has been recognized by some people for a long time. Ian Chalmers doesn't like my worries about RCTs because he really thinks that you do have to establish a counterfactual. Or here, closer to home, um, this is King, Cohen, and Verba. Nothing can be learned about the causes of the dependent variable without taking into account other instances when the independent variable takes on other values. And that lots of, uh, I think you're familiar with this view. Okay. So um, skeptics say you must establish a counterfactual to establish a singular causal claim. Then they say, and you can't do that. Okay. So I aim, to the contrary, um, to show that these non-counterfactual evidence types are evidence for a singular causal claim. I think it's obvious that they are, but then I've got engaged with these people who claim you know, what they're doing is rigorous and that there's nothing rigorous about this other stuff. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to use their own trick. Okay. I'm going to use the same device that shows that randomized controlled trials can make causal claims, which is a potential outcomes equation or what I've generalized this to, to something I call a um, situation-specific causal equation model. Okay, so I'm going to talk about that. Um, but it's really the potential outcome equation that justifies um, that RCTs make causal claims, and I'm going to use potential outcomes to show that these evidence types are uh, good evidence for causation in the single case. Okay. So here's the... Um, the outline of what I'm going to do, evidence types first. I'm going to explain what a potential outcome equation is. I'm going to then generalize these to what this scam the situation-specific causal uh, equation model. I'm going to show how these evidence types fill in the scam from which the claim derives. And so that's going to show why th that they are really evidence for the single case. I mean, it's something we take for granted, but that seems to need showing. Um, and, but before that, um, why bother? Um, well, one thing is, for post-hoc evaluation, attributions of blame and reward, we want to be able to establish singular causal claims. Um, moreover, I think more importantly, or I'm sorry, equally importantly, uh, many of these evidence types double for ex-ante prediction. 
when there are reason to think ahead of time that your cause will produce the targeted effect in this very situation. Mm -hmm. um, thirdly, um, singular causal claims can corroborate or probe general causal claims. Okay. Oops, okay. Uh, that I think people, um, many people will begin to balk at. Um, how can a, a single case right, corroborate a general causal claim? Um, we know putatively that we can't generalize from a single case. Um, well, yes, that's true, but you can't generalize from any cases. You can't generalize from 10 or 1,000 or even 40,000. We all know this. Right? Um, there are more than 2,000 swans in the Thames. They're all white. <laughs> in the right season, there are more than 40,000 swans in the UK. They're all white. Still in Sydney Harbor, as we know, right? uh, just not all swans are white. Okay. So I just want to make a remark about generalizability. Uh, I think it's a really bad idea that we're going to generalize by just you know, induction, uh, which is what uh, generalization generally means. Um, generalizability depends on projectability. It depends on having got the right concept that will hold across the class of objects you're interested in. Does not depend on sample size. Okay. So, Here's an experiment that I was a participant observer on at Stanford when I was there. Uh, 20 years, they designed this experiment to put uh, some um, gyroscopes in the space. They would preset, if, they if there was space-time curvature, the gyroscope should couple with them and precess. Very, very infinitesimal precession that I had to measure. Um, and they, so they were testing the general theory of relativity using these gyroscopes. And they drew conclusions from three gyroscopes. Okay. That's because they knew that the kind of thing they were studying was projectable. I mean, if it worked, <laughs> if these three gyroscopes precessed and coupled with space-time curvature, you know, they all would. Okay. Moreover, okay, well, moreover, the much vaunted RCTs, if we want to look at it the other way around, um, an RCT can only provide evidence that the treatment caused the effect for some individuals. So what an RCT is actually doing, if it's establishing something causal, it's not establishing a causal generality. It's, a call, it's establishing that, um, I mean, to the extent that you could trust the results, um, that uh, the treatment caused the effect in some individuals in the, somewhere in the study population. Okay. So it really is an indirect way of establishing some dis, some um, singular causal claims. Uh, so they establish singular causal claims in an RCT, but it's kind of odd because um, <laughs> we know some people now, some individuals in the study population, um, the causal claim is true for, uh, although we just don't know for whom. Right? So it seems to me they're worse than uh, you know, just dealing directly with it. So I uh, call randomized controlled trials when I'm not being very nice to them. Um, where's Wally studies? <laughs> okay. okay, so now here are my categories of evidence. Um, I think there are more that to fill in, um, but I'm going to talk about them very, very quickly because uh, they'll be familiar. So evidence, this is part one now on uh, the categories. Evidence that C caused D in an individual I. There's direct evidence that looks at aspects of the putative causal relationship itself to see if it holds, and indirect that looks at features outside that that bear on the existence of this causal relationship. Um, these aren't distinctions written in stone, right? These are a way of organizing the material. Um, I, I've isolated five kinds uh, of direct evidence. Um, many of these are familiar from Bradford Hill. Uh, you know, who did this for medicine. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is I think that this SCHEM business shows that some of those really are symptoms of causality, and some of the things he suggests I don't think are symptoms of causality. They're symptoms that um, you didn't make a measurement error. But so it is, <coughs> I think, useful. So um, the character of the cause did C occur, the cause occur at the time, in the matter of the size to be expected, had it caused E. Um, character of the effect, does it occur at the time, in the manner of the SARS to be expected, had C caused it. Um, I think you sometimes call these two together congruence. I've seen that in a lot of the social science literature. Uh, presence of support factors, uh, moderator variables, was everything in place needed that was needed for C to cause E? 
presence of intermediate steps, you know, mediator variables where the right kinds of intermediate stages present, and the operation, not just the presence of the intermediaries, but um, you know, that could accidentally have been present. Um, did they actually operate? Were they really caused by C, and did they really cause E? Uh, indirect evidence, uh, causal potency, is C the kind of thing that could cause E? Um, elimination of alternatives, that's a very famous one. What else could have produced E in this individual specific situation? And what evidence is there against them? Symptoms that the cause operated, not just that it was present, but it really operated. What further features should hold if the cause had acted as needed? And absence of derailers. Were there features that could stop C from resulting in E, and are they absent? So that's, a kind of, that's what's in my catalog. Um, and I th as I said, I think these are kind of familiar categories. Um, I hope that by talking to you, um, you'll be able to add some more, and uh, we can to figure out whether they fit the scheme seam or, or not, and if not, does it need revision or um, et cetera. Okay, so but th these are, I think, tried and true ca categories of evidencing for evidencing singular causation in the singular case. Let's go on towards um, potential outcome equations. Um, and um, I start with something I think you'll be familiar with is epidemiologist pies that were introduced by Rotman. Um, where he said, and we, I saw this in the session this morning, the QCA session, um, the, the idea is there's more than one way to skin a cat, so um, there are very different pies that each one of which is sufficient to contribute to the effect, um, but then <clears throat> each pie is itself made up of a number of factors that have to be there present together in order to bring about or make a contribution to the effect. Um, so I mean, here's an example uh, from uh, one of my colleagues in uh, North Carolina on homework, um, where homework can improve certain kinds of um, uh, outcome, re learning outcomes for students, but uh, it needs a lot of other stuff to be present too for it to, 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 to work. Okay. Now, um, the epidemiologists were the only people who were thinking about uh, causal pies at the time. Uh, a couple years before that, J, the philosopher J.L. Mackey wrote The Cement of the Universe, um, and he um, said exactly the same thing in philosopher's language, uh, which is that uh, causes, singular causes are insufficient, but necessary parts of unnecessary, but sufficient conditions. So a sufficient condition is pi, right? Um, a pi is sufficient for an effect, but not it's unnecessary for it. And then the parts of the pi are necessary in that pi, um, but they're insufficient by themselves to bring about the uh, effect. So exactly the same thing as the causal pies. Um, and Mackey wrote it um, using Boolean logic, and this looks just to me like QCA, um, that um, the effect here, x on the left, and x happens if the first conglomerate, uh, which is a1 and x1, or the last one, an minus 1, uh, and xn minus 1, um, I divide them in those two categories because he was interested in that we tended to focus on one feature, like the homework. And so that gets labeled the X, but there's no difference between the homework and the other factors that help the homework work. Um, you could think the homework is helping the other factors work, um, at least you know, so far as the, uh, what, what's been done so far. Um, okay, so that's <clears throat> uh, that was what Mackey did. He's doing yes, no variables. So really talks about it being sufficient, you know, a causal pi is sufficient for the effect to occur. Um, we tend to think uh, in terms of um, more continuous variables. Um, so the idea here is that um, the causes, different, different pies can contribute and they might all add up to uh, the final uh, effect. Um, so this is just generalizing from um, Mackey and Rotman to um, this equation where the alpha is a constant and the others are variables. Okay. So, um, oh, before that, sorry. Um, and <clears throat> the, when I talked about moderator variables earlier, um, that's what, what's represented by the A's. I call those support variables. They, I mean, if you've got a salient cause you're interested in, then uh, Mackey called them auxiliaries and I'm calling them support factors. So that's what I was referring to earlier. Okay. Um, Okay, so I want to put a little red C in front of that. 
right, because <coughs> in, um, in all these cases, um, what's supposed to be happening <coughs> is that we've got an effect on the left and these pi's on the right that are sufficient for the effect, but it's not just that they're sufficient to guarantee that the effect occurs, which could be spurious correlation, they just co-occur together. It's supposed to be that the stuff on the right is the cause of, <coughs> uh, of the effect on the left. So, and the, and the idea is that we're dealing with cases where in the real world, right, um, there, this situation, there are a set of causal possibilities of, um, and what the formula represents is it represents all the things that are present that um, you know, could contribute uh, to the effect in this very situation um, and sometimes <coughs> some of them will be actualized in this situation and those will be the real uh, causes. Okay. So now, potential outcomes equations. Potential outcomes equations are just um, those Mackey formulae. Um, and we use potential outcomes equations to justify what's going on in a randomized control trial. And all that's happened is we've taken our, um, our Mackey formula and we've taken our effect that we were interested in and called it Y, and then we've <laughs> been only interested in one particular term here, one particular cause, say the treatment, right? and then we've lumped all the other stuff into W. So X is the focal cause, W is the contribution to Y of all the other causal pi's, and beta is the net effect of the support factors. So that's what you, a potential outcome equation looks like, and I see it all the time in discussions of randomized controlled trials when people are actually talking about doing the statistics on them. Okay. So what justifies that randomized controlled trials estimate treatment effects? Well, I'm not going to bother to give you the little argument here, but you start out to do this, you start out with a potential outcomes equation, and notice it's supposed to be causal, right? We're supposed to have the causes on the right. Um, okay. And then um, you argue if certain conditions are satisfied, which the design of the experiment is supposed to help you assure, assure you are satisfied, but if these conditions are satisfied, then all right, you can start with the potential outcome equation, and you can show that the difference in the observed mean outcomes is an unbiased estimate of the study population average treatment effect. Okay. And you, so that derivation, well, my only point here is that derivation starts <laughs> with a potential outcome equation, and it ends with a justification that if it were an ideal RCT where the assumptions were really satisfied, which they never are, um, you would have an unbiased estimate of the study population eight. Okay. So now I come to SCEMS, which is by part three. Um, I call them here structural, they're really situation specific causal equation models. Um, and I'm not quite sure how I managed to slip in the word structural. I think I was talking to some economist and, and I just, I don't know, typed what was in my mind rather than what I ought, ought to have been saying. So situation specific causal equation models. Um, what they are, they look like this. And you can see that um, what, what they really are is a generalization of the potential outcome equation, but for just different outcomes that might occur between cause and effect, or before the cause, or after the effect. So um, the SCEM, it supposes that you know, we're not just looking at a cause, uh, I'm sorry, a bunch of causes and an effect, and then this particular cause of interest and the effect. Um, we're not lumping all the causes together. We're going to disaggregate. We're going to do a time slicing. Um, uh, and then we're going to assume just for the notational thing, that the variables are time ordered, which is why, since these are causal equations, um, we have the triangular form because uh, you know, nothing later causes anything earlier. Each equation gives the direct causes relative to the time slicing, um, whereas the potential outcome equation um, just lumps together a bunch of sufficient causes. Uh, they don't go through, I don't, don't have a, they're not necessarily direct causes. And then our outcome, the one we're interested in, I'm going to call it E, could be anywhere. It could be, say, X5, and our cause of interest could also be anywhere. It could be X2. Okay. Now, the point is just that, you know, that the economists do that potential outcome equation stuff, um, and um, the scam is just a generalization of that, 
but it's richer than the single potential outcome equation um, because it represents causes of causes in, in, and intermediate steps and then further effects. And that being, having a richer representation can actually be very informative. So just for example, um, think about further effects. Um, so here's a little me 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 mention in process tracing. The existence of official minutes of a meeting, as we know, if authentic, provides strong proof that a meeting took place. So what we're doing there is we're looking at effects of, say, the effect. We were interested in whether the effect was, did a meeting take place? And we're actually not looking at intermediate steps. Did the cause produce the meeting? But did it act okay? So, so now here are my categories of evidence for C caused E. In situation, in individual eye, and in situation, this very specific targeted situation. Uh, you'll notice that I've just um, repeated it, and it could repeat and repeat because if you're looking at, um, if you're looking, for instance, whether the moderators operated, I mean, how would you know whether the moderators, um, uh, the, sorry, the mediators did their job? Well, you could, again, that's a causal connection. Did this, you know, did the cause cause the next step, and the next step cause the next step, and the next step cause the next step? So each of those is a causal connection that itself <coughs> can have um, direct and indirect evidence. So this chart can just keep going on uh, and on. Okay. Now, what I, um, oh, I've been very quick. <laughs> uh, 42 slides, and I'm going to finish them in half an hour. Uh, justifying these as evidence. Um, so the point of the scam is that each of these types of evidence helps establish something about a feature in the scam relevant to the existence of a causal pathway from C to E. Okay. Um, so this is where, the, uh, where we're getting the real derivation business. And um, I, I can do that for um, every one of those evidence types, uh, but I'm just going to give you a kind of example. And I'm sorry I don't have a real example. Um, I was looking for one, and they were all so controversial. I thought, <laughs> you know, as soon as I give this example, people are going to say, well, you know, you haven't got quite the, you don't have the example quite right. Okay. Um, but say, look at cause characteristics and effect characteristics and the congruence between them. Um, we, um, we see this in the size relations. I mean, so we're actually claiming uh, in the scam, you know, you, have, you write down your causal model for the case, and you're making, um, you're making hypothesis about um, not only that x1 causes x2, if, if you're right, if, if, if that a, if that a, I mean, I have left the cause, I've left the constants out. I mean, if, if it's actually there, right? actually we're claiming that x1 caused x2, and that they have a certain size relation. I mean, you could do these a bit more qualitatively, but the point is that the scam actually posits um, what the kind of relation is supposed to be between them, and if you notice that you've got the right size effect relationship, what you're doing is you're um, fixing that equality sign there. Or time. Right, are they, <coughs> do they occur at the right times? Well, if you've done your time slicing, you can see whether or not, relative to your hypothesized model, the effect is occurring too soon, too late. So some of my friends who do, um, who are worried about randomized control trials and um, <coughs> uh, say talking, worry about them not being appropriate for talking therapies, um, and are sort of worried about CBT, uh, claim um, that one of the problems they think with the evidence for the effectiveness of CBTs is that sometimes, an awful lot of the cases, um, the, uh, the improvement has come either too soon or too late given the CBT theory itself. Okay. Now, whether that's true or not, but it's the kind of thing that you see you know, would be at work here. Or we would say, Malcolm had CBT, and well, he got a whole lot better after he went to his first session. Well, that's, just, <laughs> that's really not evidence that uh, the CBT uh, was responsible for Malcolm's improvement. Okay, so time, uh, the timing uh, comes from time slicing and the indexing of the Xs. Um, what about the operation of mediators? Well, I think that's pretty obvious. Um, so. Imagine that x1 is our target cause, and then mediator we've hypothesized in our model. I mean, this is a, 
we're making a little bit use of a, a logic model here or a theory of change. x1 causes x2 and x2 causes x3 and x3 causes x4. Um, so if we have <coughs> evidence of the intermediaries actually occurred of the size they were supposed to, that gives us uh, as we expected, right? Uh, not surprisingly, evidence uh, that the initial cause produced its effect. But the point is that um, it, we, we see why it's evidence using a potential outcomes equation framework just like the RCTs do. do. Um, elimination of alternatives. Well, <laughs> here's all the pies <laughs> that could bring about the effect. Um, and the question is, do I mean, or the other factors that could be doing it, sufficient to do it. So do all of these guys add up to that? Um, so again, the elimination of alternatives, which is a standard and obvious way to evidence uh, any kind of a claim, um, is, fits into the SCHEM model very nicely. So schemes play a vital role in evidencing singular causal claims. Maybe you can do it some other way. Right? But um, <clears throat> I wanted to find a way that, um, you know, where I had a rigorous proof that these are actually relevant types of evidence. Um, they provide the framework for a principal derivation that RCTs, first, you know, schemes are what you use in the RCT derivation. They, pro they provide a principal derivation that RCTs do what's claimed for them and evidencing their causal claims that say somebody in the treatment group got better, somebody we know not whom, um, and they help us justify that features from our catalog evidence um, really do evidence singular causal connections um, as we actually knew all along. So <clears throat> when we're thinking about scams, I think they have um, a, a lot going for them. Um, they provide a rigorous justification that our evidence types are evidence for singular causal claims. And how? I mean, you can begin to see how they're evidence. Um, now, that's, I think, important because they thereby provide a way of systematizing the evidence. I mean, you can, you've got all these things that, you, that in daily life, say in a trial, <laughs> we're used to collecting together. And then we have odd bits here and there. And, um, if we have our, um, the catalog of evidence and then we connect it with a hypothesized causal model, um, we can see exactly where each piece of evidence fits and then we can begin to question um, you know, how to put the evidence together. For instance, you can see, let's see if I have this written down. So um, it helps us assess the strength of the evidence because um, you can make explicit and so you can see what's being assumed, right? So the first thing is you, it's like writing down your logic model, only you've got a very extended logic model that actually has the moderator variables and causes of causes and um, effects of effects. Um, you can see and make, you make explicit and hence can see just what's assumed. Um, and then you can see what role each piece of evidence plays and you know, which piece, what is it doing? Uh, what's it teaching us about the scam? Uh, does it teach us enough that we feel confident that uh, we c you, know, you can make the inference from start to finish? And it tells you what's missing. Right? And all of that's necessary to deciding how, how, how strong your case is. Uh, so, I mean, do you have a vital piece missing, an intermediary missing? Well, how troubling should that be? But w when you've got the scam, you've got, you're in a very good position to to see exactly what's going on. Um, and, um, okay. Now, if you don't like them, there's some <laughs> easy things to, 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 to criticize them for. Um, the one thing I didn't write down, um, but you can't use them to estimate an effect size because, after all, you're just doing a single case. I mean, you can actually use them to estimate um, how much I mean, if you had a really good causal model that you felt fairly confident about, you, you could actually use it to estimate how much the cause contributed to the effect in this case, right? um, as, you know, as long as you had relatively good evidence about the other, um, the other pies, uh, which one often doesn't. Um, but so you, depending on how much evidence you have, you can estimate um, the size of the effect in a single case. Okay. 
uh, which is the analog of getting the average treatment effect. And of course, it's better. It's harder to get <laughs> because you need, you need to have good luck with the kind of evidence you can get. But you've got um, evidence really about you know, a particular individual. Um, apart from that, um, there's, no, uh, there's no way to, if you thought that p-values were important or you thought that having a likelihood or a confidence interval, right? I mean, a confidence interval for the single case, I mean, how confident can we be that this singular causal claim we've now got a lot of evidence for, but then there are gaps in our evidence. How confident can we be about the singular causal claim? Well, as far as I can make out, there's no formula for estimating a probability like that. I don't mind that uh, because I'm not a Bayesian and I, and I don't think there are objective probabilities for the single case. Um, so I'm not quite sure what one would be doing in estimating a probability, but it would be nice to have some way you know, that you didn't have to think and you didn't have to make a bet. <laughs> um, it would be nice if somebody, God gave you a formula and said, well, if you've got these six piece kinds of evidence, it's pretty confident, and if you don't, but there ain't any such thing. But I think that's just life in the social sciences. Okay. Um, the other major, the really major criticism I find of evidencing the single case um, in uh, the people who don't like doing it is that it's too model heavy. I mean, after all, I said, well, you've got to produce this um, model. <laughs> uh, and um, I'm told that we do RCTs because we don't l trust models, right? <laughs> there are too many assumptions that go into them uh, that it cannot be independently verified. So we're told they're too model heavy. Um, whereas, I'm constantly being told, and I had a hard time finding, if anybody can send me quotes, I'm told this all the time in discussion that in, with RCTs, you do inference by design. It's the study design. You don't, it's like part of the credibility revolution. We don't have to make incredible or unbacked up, unwarranted assumptions. You, it's just the study design that entitles you to the inference. Um, but here's one place I found a remark of it. A research design is a characterization a design right, of the logic that connects the data to the causal inferences. It is essentially an argument as to why someone ought to believe the results. Okay? In the case of a randomized controlled trial, there's little room for doubt about the causal effects of the treatment, so there's hardly any argument necessary. The, you know, the result is supposed to be carried by design alone. We don't need um, to make the additional assumptions and defend them. Well, no, we don't. <laughs> it's just not true that with an RCT, you do inference by design. Um, we all know, um, well, we all know that there's a lot of statistical fiddling that has to happen um, with problems of dropout and non-compliance and so forth. But the thing I find there's no system, and, but that I have find there's a lot of systematic work on. I, mean, I want to point out that the systematic work all has to make substantive assumptions. I mean, you can't adjust for non-compliance and dropout and so forth without making assumptions about the character of the population you're studying. But worse than that, I feel, um, is um, things, life exists <laughs> between random assignment and the final reporting of the recording and reporting and analyzing the data. <laughs> There's a ton of time in between and things happen to the treatment group and the control group and to the people administering them and to the statisticians, who, the people who do the measurements, etc. cetera. Um, uh, tons of stuff happens post-random assignment. Almost always when I've been reading, I've been reading a lot on, um, you know, unbiased estimates and do we really, what good is an unbiased estimate and would we rather have a precise estimate than an unbiased estimate? But you know, standardly, you know, almost everyone says, you know, the, um, the random assignment guarantees um, that you get an unbiased estimate. But it doesn't, of course. I mean, it has to be that nothing happens, no confounding happens post-randomization. Um, and um, lots and lots of things happen post-randomization. We all know um, already about quadruple blinding in order to stop some of the causal factors that we know could create a, 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 an imbalance uh, in expectation. Um, 
you know, we want to blind the, uh, the people receiving the treatment, you want to blind the people delivering it, you want to blind the people making the measurements uh, of the outcomes, you want to blind the statisticians. We know we want to blind the statisticians, and we think about the worm wars, where the epidemiologists um, reanalyzed the data from the original Kenyan study and claimed they got quite different results than when the economists did it, and then the economists and epidemiologists, all right, was it two summers ago, had <laughs> rather violent clashes over you know, which was the right analysis of the data. Um, okay, so, uh, <clears throat> but apart from that, I mean, those are things that are known. How do we know them? Where do they fit? Um, I go to, but there are lots of other things that can happen. Um, you will all know real life cases that happen in villages or in schools um, where uh, things happen post-randomization um, that the treatment group and the control group have some systematic difference between them that ought not to have happened. Um, I was thinking I go to um, an eye clinic and um, I sit in the eye clinic um, for hours because you know, it's a serious clinic. I have to see a real consultant and it's very busy. I sit in a waiting room and I sit next to a machine that dispenses for a two pound coin um, sugary snacks, <laughs> uh, crisps, and etc. Uh, now, um, I imagine I'm in the treatment group right? <laughs> because I have to see the real consultant. Uh, so I'm the one who's sitting there next to the machine for three hours. Uh, I think the control group right, whisks, gets whisked in uh, to see another pretend consultant uh, and never sits by them. It's a good thing it's not a diabetes study. That's my feeling. Okay. So things happen post-randomization, and it really annoys me that um, the people whom I know who defend randomized control trials and how really much more super they are than a lot of the other methods you use, um, they don't approach this explicitly. So my feeling is um, that things happen post-randomization. You may be lucky and they didn't, but you can handle that casually and piecemeal, which doesn't seem to me goes along with the calls for rigor that we hear um, you know, that RCTs are supposed to be so good because they're rigorous. So you can either handle that casually and piecemeal or you can build a scam and do it properly. <laughs> you know, you can't actually um, patrol for external causes that affect the effect differentially between the treatment and the control group without having some hypotheses about what they are and what causes them and how you'd know whether they were there or not. And that's really what you do in building a scam, um, you know, is you build an extended model of what besides the treatment could be um, that's happening kind of outside that you didn't think of could be affecting the effect. So um, I don't actually think you can justify your RCT results without building a scam anyway. So conclusions, which are very short. Um, uh, we can have principled evidence for singular causation, and it's, and it's evidence of just the kind that we normally produce in process tracing and case studies. Um, and in trials, we can have lots of evidence for causation in the single case, whether it's you know, whether you're lucky and you can get enough to feel the matter's been settled, that's a, that's a, a question. I mean, you can't always get enough evidence, but absence of evidence doesn't mean you, you can conclude that it, the causal hypothesis is false, of course, but um, you just can't draw a conclusion at all. But you can have lots of evidence of different kinds for singular causation, and you can do that without any thoughts of establishing a counterfactual. So you're definitely not stuck with where's Wally study. You can look at each Wally individually. So thank you. <laughs>